My name is Margaret Robinson, and I'm here to talk to you about Aboriginal veganism. And I'll talk mostly about veganism as opposed to vegetarianism, because veganism isn't just a diet, but it's a lifestyle that avoids the use of animal products. So I'll start by saying a bit about who I am, and I'll outline three barriers that I see to Aboriginal veganism. Then I'll talk about traditional food and the animal-human relationship in Mi'kmaq legends. And I'll end with the concept of Mesitnomak, which means all my relations. Uh, I'm a U of T alumna. I completed my master's degree here in 2001 and my PhD in 2009. I'm a two-spirited Mi'kmaq woman uh, from the Bone Clan, and I'm from Nova Scotia. I gained Indian status in November of 2011 under Bill C-3. And my ancestors come from Lennox Island in Prince Edward Island. And I'm also a vegan. How did that happen? <laughs> Well, it was a slow process. In December of 2005, my partner and I moved out of the U of T residence at 30 Charles Street into a lovely apartment at the corner of Chinatown and Kensington Market. And immediately we came face to face with the issue of food. Uh, How many people here have been to Chinatown or Kensington Market area? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. There's a very different food culture uh, present there. And I'd been brought up on supermarket meat, which, as you know, comes dissected in white styrofoam packages covered in plastic wrap. So it's difficult seeing a chicken breast in that kind of setting um, to ever imagine it was part of a living creature. The packaging is designed to help us forget what meat is. But in Chinatown and Kensington Market, they sell animals as they are. There's a pig head or an entire gutted goat carcass hanging in the butcher shop. Uh, Chickens have heads and feet. Live crabs are kept in buckets. So the reality of meat eating is extremely visible there. And seeing that reality every day brought to consciousness a thought that had long been bubbling at the back of my mind. I'm eating dead animals. A key turning point for me was Christmas of 2007. It had been a tradition in my partner's family to make a seafood chowder at Christmas. So when we moved to Toronto, I started doing this for us. And I needed fish. So... All the markets in Kensington were closed for the holiday, and I went to Chinatown, and I got a fish. But instead of a clean white de bone filet in a package, it was an entire fish with eyes and teeth and everything. Um, So I got this dead fish on my counter, and I started trying to filet it. And my knives were dull, and I was inexperienced, and I soon found I was elbow deep in this fish autopsy. And I was trying to butcher it with these blunt tools, and I suddenly realized this isn't meant to come apart. That is, they don't have fillets that you remove. They have muscles and bones. And as I tried to prepare this chowder, I realized that the fish's body was designed for its own life, not for my food. Um, In philosophical terms, I realized that the ontology of the fish, its essence as a being, was different than I had previously thought. It wasn't for me, it was for itself. So that was another push in the right direction for me. Um, And then finally, we got cats as one does. Uh, We got two at first. My partner and I had grown up with cats, but neither of us had had a pet for about 20 years. Uh, And interacting with them every day reminded us that they're individuals. There's a someone inside there. And that was probably the tipping point for both of us. Um, The goats and the pigs and the crabs and the fish and the cats all came together for us. And we started thinking differently about how we eat and how we live. So we stopped eating meat. And the activity of not eating meat began to sensitize me to things that I had been doing psychologically in order to be able to eat meat. I had ignored the aspects of meat that reminded me that it was somebody's body, like the veins or the tendons. And it made me realize that I had separated myself from other animals and created walls in my psyche to enable me to see animals as objects. And once that illusion was gone, I had to ask myself if I was willing to pay the emotional and the moral price it was going to take to continue to consume animals now that I had this new awareness. And for me, the answer was no. So we went vegan. And at the same time, I was getting more involved in Aboriginal culture. My family was culturally assimilated in a lot of ways. My grandmother lost her status when she married a man who wasn't native. And that was a method the federal government used to reduce the number of people who were eligible for treaty rights. So she didn't receive her status back till 1985 under Bill C-31. But that status didn't extend to the rest of us. So we grew up as non-status natives, which meant we couldn't live on reserve 
we couldn't access treaty rights, and it separated us from a lot of cultural activities. So while I grew up knowing we were Native, people didn't really talk about it. Uh, that was partly a strategy to avoid racism. So I don't know any Mi'kmaq words, I didn't know any Mi'kmaq words, and I didn't know any Mi'kmaq songs, or own any Mi'kmaq clothes, or have any Mi'kmaq friends. In my parents' and grandparents' day, being Aboriginal was something to be ashamed of. My grandmother used to tell people she was Chinese. But I felt a little differently about it. Since I'm a researcher, I started researching. I read a lot. I joined the Aboriginal caucus at my workplace. I went to a sweat lodge. I met with elders. I attended cultural events. And it started to mean something to me and became important to me as a part of my identity. It might not surprise you to know there don't seem to be a lot of Aboriginal vegans. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. To start, Aboriginal food culture isn't individual, it's communal. At a feast, for instance, you don't just stroll along the buffet line like you're on a cruise ship and select the food you'd like to eat. At some feasts, you don't select your food at all. Somebody else does that for you. There are dishes that are intended to be eaten by everyone, and there are some dishes that have to be consumed in their entirety in one sitting. So there are a lot of protocols around eating in Indigenous culture. And I didn't know any of them. Luckily, I made friends who could walk me through it. And for example, they would eat my portion of a moose stew. So I ate a lot of bannock and filled up on wild rice and blueberries. When you interact with people who aren't vegan, some of you may find this, you end up asking a lot of questions about the ingredients in food. So you don't get an unpleasant surprise. But having dietary boundaries also singles you out as separate from people. And when you're trying to fit into a community, being signaled out as separate can be very painful. Of course, not every Aboriginal event is like that. When I attend an academic conference on Aboriginal issues, for example, they're pretty savvy about diet. They accommodate vegans without a problem. But I had a problem, and it was this. Just as I was starting to belong to an Indigenous community, I'd had this awakening about food and my relationship to animals that threatened to put a barrier between me and the Aboriginal culture I was trying to adopt. And I didn't want to feel inauthentic. Authenticity is tricky. Like other racialized minorities, Aboriginal people don't control how people see us or how we are represented to others. So we encounter a lot of stereotypes, particularly the double-sided coin of noble savage and ignoble savage, or the good Indian and the bad Indian. The ignoble savage or the bad Indian stereotype portrays us as too primitive to have any ethics, or as having some sort of primal nature that's too backward to live on anything but meat. And there's a certain aggressive masculinity in that stereotype that sees anything other than a huntier lifestyle as effeminate and weak. And I bristle at the sexism and the racism in that kind of a stereotype. On the flip side, the noble savage paints us as inherently closer to nature and assumes that gives us a special right to eat animals. And I found myself questioning both of these stereotypes, whether I encountered them in white or in Aboriginal communities. The image the native person, in Canadian culture particularly, but also in the US, has been frozen in time. What is considered authentic and traditional has been frozen at the point of colonial contact. So people ignore modern expressions of Aboriginal values. Whether it's hip hop or graffiti art or veganism, cultural expressions are often dismissed as not native enough, unless they predate a colonial contact. Well, my ancestors didn't fight 400 years of colonialism to be told what makes a real Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq have a philosophy tradition. Reflecting on how best to live is something we've done a lot and for a long time. And I wanted to bring my intellect to bear on the question of how to live as a Mi'kmaq woman in the 21st century, in downtown Toronto, in Chinatown, in Kensington Market. So I went to our legends, looking for something that would resonate with the kind of person I am and the kind of politics that I was developing. I grew up in a family where people respected animals and understood them to have their own selfhood. Although my family ate meat, it was seen as a regrettable thing that had to be done. As I grew older, I realized it is a regrettable thing, but it doesn't actually have to be done. I started rethinking what that could mean, and I found myself questioning why particular practices were traditional, and what values those traditions embodied, whether they were my values or not, and whether traditional practices were still working for us. My training is in theology, and I'm skilled in textual analysis, so I started reading our Mi'kmaq legends. 
What are the values, I ask myself, in these stories? How is our relationship with animals represented? And what kind of relationship is held out as the ideal? And I'd like to share some of what I learned with you. I mentioned that there aren't, as far as I can tell, a lot of Aboriginal vegans, and I see three reasons for this. The first problem is that veganism is often equated with whiteness, and as a result, Aboriginal vegans are assumed to be inauthentic and assimilated. In a joke at the beginning of his documentary, Redsters, Tricksters, and Puppy Stew, Ojibwe playwright Drew Hayden Taylor asks, what do you call a native vegetarian? His answer, a very bad hunter. The implication is that for an Aboriginal person, choosing a non-meat diet is a kind of cultural failure. In Stuff White People Like, satirical author Christian Lander portrays veganism as a tactic for maintaining white supremacy. He writes, as with many white people activities, being vegan or vegetarian enables them to feel as though they're helping the environment, and it gives them a sweet way to feel superior to others. A third example. In his book, Red Blood, One Mostly White Guy's Encounters with the Native World, ecologist and Greenpeace founder Robert Hunter depicts vegans as eco-Jesuits and veggie fundamentalists who force natives to do things the white man's way. By projecting white imperialism onto vegans, Hunter enables white omnivores, such as himself, to bond with Aboriginal people over meat-eating. When veganism is constructed as white, Aboriginal people who avoid the use of animal products are depicted as sacrificing our cultural authenticity. This presents a challenge for those of, like myself who view our veganism as ethically, spiritually, and culturally compatible with our indigeneity. A second barrier to Aboriginal veganism is its portrayal as a product of class privilege. Opponents claim that a vegan diet is an indulgence, and that the poor, among whom Aboriginal people are disproportionately represented, can't afford to be so picky. This argument assumes that processed mock meats, such as Eve's veggie cuisine or Morningstar farm products, or imported organic produce from Whole Foods or the Big Carrot, make up the bulk of a vegan diet. Such an argument overlooks the actual living conditions of most of the world's vegans, overlooks the economic and environmental cost of meat, and overlooks the subsidized meat and dairy industries in North America, assuming that they're representative of the world. But you might ask, isn't it dangerous to suggest, that creating an to suggest creating an indigenous veganism when indigenous culture is already under siege from colonial forces? Maybe it is. But my proposal is not that we replace a vibrant traditional food culture with one associated with privileged white culture. The eating habits of the Mi'kmaq have already been colonized and are further complicated by poverty. As a participant in Benita Lawrence's study of mixed blood, urban, native identity explained, People have been habituated to think that poverty is native, so your macaroni soup and your poor diet is native. When we eat inexpensive foods often enough, they become seen as traditional, when in reality they're an expression of our own economic exploitation and oppression. So Aboriginal restaurants, such as Tea and Bannock, have bologna, wieners, and click brand canned meat wrapped in fry bread on their menu. What we're doing is traditionalizing our own poverty. Lack of access to nutrient-rich foods is actually a problem that Aboriginal people have in common with other racialized and economically oppressed groups. Dr. Breeze Harper, founder of Sista Vegan Project, notes, Within the mainstream, it's assumed that everyone is white, middle class, and has the transportation, financial, and educational means to access healthier and tastier foods. The mainstream food movement generally doesn't think about environmental racism, food deserts, the legacies of colonialism on brown, black, and red bodies. The food deserts to which Dr. Harper refers are areas where no fresh produce is available, or where economic and physical barriers prevent people from obtaining healthy food. So, for example, places where zoning, or so-called job creation projects, encourage the development of fast food outlets, but not of independent grocery stores. Many Aboriginal people on reserves live in just such a food desert. Professor of Human Ecology Kim Travers cites three causes of nutrient-poor diet among the Mi'kmaq. The first is low income. The second is lack of access to transportation. And the third is that reserve land is unsuitable for agriculture, fishing, or hunting. Travers notes that Mi'kmaq people living on reserve are often limited to eating highly processed protein, such as peanut butter, wieners, or bologna. The fact is, colonialism is bad for us. 
the reserve system has resulted in a diet that is high in sugar and carbohydrates and low in protein and fiber. As a result, Mi'kmaq people have a serious increase in diabetes mellitus and gallstones. Kanju Briggs Jr. of the Africana Institute argues that in the U.S., poor communities of color are often bereft of access to fresh, healthy foods and disproportionately find themselves afflicted with diseases of Western diets and lifestyles. And Briggs identifies this as a tactic of class warfare aimed at keeping the most chronically impoverished from being able to access healthy food and to live healthy, long lives, high-functioning, and from excelling as human beings. So I'd argue that the second barrier to Aboriginal veganism is colonialism itself, especially the economic arm of colonialism. What's the third barrier? Well, that would be history. It's hard to frame veganism as a traditional activity. Historically, the Mi'kmaq diet was meat-heavy. We ate beaver, fish, eels, birds, porcupine, and sometimes larger animals such as whales, moose, or caribou. And we supplemented this meaty diet with vegetables, roots, nuts, and berries. The use of animals as food figures prominently in our legends, so that's an issue. As well, food production is gendered in Mi'kmaq culture. Hunting was a traditionally male activity connected with the maintenance of virility. The killing of a moose, for example, symbolized a boy's entry into manhood. So when you challenge the hunting tradition, you're challenging how Mi'kmaq men understand their masculinity. Hunting culture in general tends to have inherent assumptions about masculinity, even if it's women doing the hunting. There's often this type of manliness associated with it. Like many types of aggression, it's gendered as masculine. And some of that is present in Mi'kmaq culture too. For example, it was a traditional Mi'kmaq belief that if a menstruating woman came in contact with your musket, it would fail you in hunting or in battle, and might lead to failure in other areas too. You know what I mean. At the same time, I want to suggest that the context in which Aboriginal gender identity develops has changed significantly since colonization. Meat-eating, hunting, and the domination of nature as symbols of patriarchal power actually bind us closer to white colonialism than practices such as veganism do. Veganism might be white, but it's certainly not hegemonic. Carol Adams argues that the creation of meat as a concept requires the removal of our consciousness of the animal whose dead body we are redefining as food. Adams writes, the function of the absent referent is to keep our meat separate from any idea that she or he was once an animal, to keep something from being seen as someone. Once the existence of meat is disconnected from the existence of an animal who was killed to become that meat, meat becomes unanchored by its original referent, the animal, becoming instead a free-floating image used to reflect women's status as well as animals. As a feminist and as an aboriginal woman, I had concerns about social systems that supported depersonalization, objectification, and domination of women and of animals. But I was stuck, because everywhere I looked, Natives ate meat. So desperate for some way to understand my veganism, to together with my Mi'kmaq culture, I started delving into our legends. While evident in the fur trade, the fishing industry, and factory farming, the detachment that Adams describes, that absent referent, is not foundational to Mi'kmaq oral culture. In our stories, the othering of animal life that makes meat eating possible and psychologically comfortable is replaced by a model of creation in which animals are our siblings. Mi'kmaq legends view humanity and animal life as being on a continuum, both spiritually and physically. Animals speak, they're able to change into humans, some humans marry these shape-shifting creatures and raise animal children. In the story of the magical coat, shoes, and sword, for example, a young man goes in search of his sisters and discovers that they have each married shape-shifting husbands, one a whale, one a sheep, and one a goose. In the history of Yusi Bulaju, a young girl marries a magician who can transform into a bear. Yusi Bulaju's sister falls asleep on the shore, where a whale named Butap sees her and falls in love. And Butap carries her off to live with his pod. She and Butap have a son together who is also a whale. But the sister misses her home and her brother, who at this point in the story for some reason is tied up and immobilized in a tree through magic. Um, so the whale's the whale bride's sister-in-law notices her depression and helps her leave the pod and free her brother from the tree. Yusip Bulaju marries the whale woman 
uh, that helped his sister, and they have sons together. One day, while wandering in the fog, the woman and her children hear the singing of Budap's whale pod. Through the power of the song, they're transformed back into whales, and they join the passing pod. You see, Bulaju wakes up just in time to see his wife and children, now whales, leaving with Budap toward their distant home. This is just one of numerous human-animal transformations in the Mi'kmaq legends. Some people transform into their tiamul, or totem animal, and still others are changed into animals against their wishes, as in the story of the boy who was transformed into a horse, who, you guessed it, is turned into a horse <laughs> by an evil slave master until he's rescued by his brother. So I'd like to suggest that an eco-feminist reading of Mi'kmaq legends enables us to frame veganism as a spiritual practice that recognizes that humans and other animals possess a shared personhood. Mi'kmaq legends portray human beings as intimately connected with the natural world. A uh, quick show of hands, who's familiar with Glooscap, the character of Glooscap? Hardly anybody. Ooh. Uh, Glooscap is kind of neat. He's very much an all-purpose hero figure. He's a man made from the dirt. He's the archetype of the perfect Mi'kmaq. He's a parallel to Hercules or Superman. And in his interactions with animals, he's usually an arbiter of disagreements. Um, he's first and foremost their friend. The Mi'kmaq have a phrase, Mesitnomak, which means all my relations. And that means not only the people and the ancestors to whom we're related, but it also means the human being on a continuum with other animals to whom we're related. And those are the kinds of things that you see in Mi'kmaq legends. Glooscap is formed from the red clay of the soil, um, which tells us he's probably from Prince Edward Island. And he initially lacks mobility, being trapped on his back in the dirt. Uh, his nephew in the stories was originally sea foam caught in sweet grass, and his mother began life as a leaf. In the story of Nakumi and Fire, the creator makes a grandmother, Nakumi, for Glooscap, from a dew-covered rock. So you can already see in the legends, um, human beings originate from the nature around them. Uh, Glooscap meets Nakumi, and she agrees to become his grandmother, providing wisdom in exchange for food. When Nakumi explains she can't live on plants and berries alone, Glooscap calls to Martin and asks him to give up his life so that Glooscap's grandmother can live. Martin agrees because of his friendship with Glooscap. And for this sacrifice, Glooscap makes Martin his brother. So in a lot of stories, Glooscap and Martin live together in a wigwam. Based on this story, it seems like Glooscap wasn't a hunter prior to the arrival of his grandmother. The story also represents, through the characters of Glooscap and Martin, the basic relationship of the Mi'kmaq people with the creatures that surround them. The animals are willing, out of love, to sacrifice themselves to provide food and clothing, shelter and tools, but they must always treat, be treated with the respect given to a brother and a friend. Another Mi'kmaq creation story tells of the birth of Glooscap's nephew from sea foam, caught in sweetgrass. And to celebrate the nephew's arrival, Glooscap and his family have a feast of fish. So Glooscap calls upon the salmon of the rivers and the seas to come to shore and give up their lives to feed his nephew. Although not unproblematic, the dynamic is at least open to the possibility of refusal on the part of the animal. Glooscap doesn't have control over the animals. He has influence. As well, the story undermines the widespread view that we have an innate right to use animal flesh as food. The theme in the Mi'kmaq stories is one of dependence, not dominion. Animals have independent lives, their own purpose, and their own relationships with the creator. They are not created for food, but willingly become food as a sacrifice for their friends. And this is a far cry from the perspective of the wife colonial hunter, in which animals are constructed as requiring population control, turning slaughter into a service performed, rather than one received. An interesting exception to this thread is the Wabanaki story of Glooscap and his people, which blames the animals themselves for man's aggression toward them. In this tale, there's a character called Malsum, who is an evil counterpart to Glooscap, and he turns the animals against human beings. So Glooscap announces, I made the animals to be man's friends, but they have acted with selfishness and treachery. Hereafter they shall be your servants and provide you with food and clothing. The original vision of harmony is lost, and inequality takes its place as punishment for listening to Malsum. In this way, the story is similar to the Genesis story of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. Glooscap shows the men how to make bows, arrows, and spears, and he shows the women how to scrape hides and make clothing. Now you have power over even the largest wild creatures, he said. 
Yet I charge you to use the power gently. If you take more game than you need for food and clothing, or kill for the pleasure of killing, then you will be visited by a pitiless giant named Famine. Even in this story, which attempts to justify dominion, the proper relation to the animals is only for food and clothing. If animal consent is required to justify their consumption, then it opens the possibility that such consent can be revoked. Overfishing, overhunting, and the wholesale destruction of their natural habitat would certainly give animals cause to rethink the bargain. Moreover, if animal sacrifice is instituted because of the need for food, clothing, tools, and shelter, then access to non-animal products would seem to eliminate the foundation of hunting itself. Another feature of Micmac stories is the regret that comes with animal death. In the legend of the wild goose, the birds initially come and go on their own, but many of the smaller birds get lost or die of cold or lack of food. When Glooscap learned this, he cried and cried. Finally, Glooscap charged the Canada goose with protection of all birds. The geese will be the first to migrate south when it gets cold, and they will lead the other smaller birds to safety, food, and warmth in the south, and lead them back again in the spring. In Nakumi and Fire, Glooskap's grandmother explains that she needs meat to live. After Martin agrees to the sacrifice, Glooskap snaps Martin's neck and places him on the ground, but immediately regrets his actions. Seeing Glooskap's pain, Nakumi speaks to the creator, and Martin comes back to life and returns to his home in the river. On the ground now lays the body of another Martin. This story is far from a straightforward tale of why we eat animals. Martin is both dead and alive. Dead as a body available for consumption by the grandmother, but alive as Martin, the friend of Glooskap and his people. Another story, The Adventure of Katuguasis, tells how Glooskap's grandmother used magic to obtain unlimited amounts of beaver meat from a single bone, reflecting a wish for abundance disconnected from the need to hunt. Magical food also appears in the story of Glooskap and Migamwiso, and the magical food belt and flute, both of which feature an enchanted bowl of food that never empties, no matter how much you eat. Regret and kinship also feature in the story of Muin, the bear's child. In one version of this tale, a young boy, Siko, is trapped in a cave by his evil stepfather and left to die. The animals hear Siko crying, but only the bear is strong enough to move the rocks, blocking the cave entrance. Siko is adopted and raised as a bear. Later, Siko's bear family is attacked by hunters, and his mother is killed. He addresses the hunters in Micmac and pleads for them to spare his sister. I am a human, like you, Siko says. Spare the she-cub, my adopted sister. The amazed hunters put down their weapons and gladly spare the cub. In addition, they are sorry for having killed the bear who had been so good to Siko. Here we see that regret at animal death is contextualized in the kinship relationship between humans and animals. At the end of the story, Siko declares, I shall be called Muin, the bear's son, from this day forward, and when I am grown and a hunter, never will I kill a mother bear or bear children. And Muin never did. This regret is also expressed in ritual surrounding the act of hunting. Micmac Elder and Regina Marshall describes one ritual, a dance, to thank the spirit of the animal for giving its life for food. In the dance, one displays hunting abilities and skills through a reenactment of the hunt. People sing and share stories as the dance is performed. In contrast to the view of humans as distinguished from animals by speech and thought, in our Micmac legends, animals are not only capable of thought and speech, but can be said to be people. The value of the animal lies not in its utility to man, but in its very essence as a living being. Happily for me, not all Micmac food traditions center upon meat. Glooskap's grandmother was a leaf on a tree, given life and human form by the sun, and the feast celebrating her birth consists of plants, roots, berries, nuts, and fruit, which were traditionally gathered by women. If we recognize that the activities traditionally performed by Micmac women, such as fruit, vegetable, and nut gathering, are also fully aboriginal traditions, then we can form indigenous counter-narratives to meat promotion. If women initiated hunting, as in the story of Glooskap's grandmother, then surely changing circumstances empower us to end it. The values obtained from an eco-feminist ex exegesis of Micmac stories can serve as a starting point for indigenous veganism. The personhood of animals, their self-determination, and our regret at their death all show that choosing not to ask for their sacrifice is a legitimately aboriginal option. 
Since the consumption of animals for food, clothing, and shelter is no longer necessary, as vegan culture testifies, the Mi'kmaq legend suggests that hunting and killing our animal brothers is no longer authorized. One of the things I like about being Mi'kmaq is that we have a value of non-interference. So even if people disagree with what you're doing, they're usually not very confrontational about it. There's a tradition of letting people be as strange and as weird as they want, as long as it's not interfering with other people. And if animals are our siblings, as our legends claim, I think there's an argument to be made to extend this philosophy of non-interference to their lives as well. Not only in our diet, but in all the products we consume and use, and in the way we interact with the land and its resources, which are their home. Because Aboriginal people are the targets of genocide, the cultural practices we adopt or reject are vitally important. Benita Lawrence notes that daily life practices have been used to assess how authentic Native identity claims are, to accord Indian status, and to assess land claims. Adopting practices such as veganism can impact how white authorities assess our treaty rights. Native land claims in BC and Massachusetts have been rejected because the claimants held jobs and ate pizza instead of living off the land. Yet those who value only the preservation of tradition join with colonialism in seeing no place for contemporary aboriginality. There's more to my culture and to my relationship with the land than hunting and killing animals. One must also be aware of changing circumstances and needs among the Mi'kmaq. As research shows, Mi'kmaq people living on reserve are dependent on store-bought food. In addition, half of Canada's Aboriginal population lives in urban areas. When Aboriginality is defined as a primordial lifestyle, it reflects our intentional extinction as a people. One of the turning points for Aboriginal treaty rights in Nova Scotia had to do with the fishery. In August of 1993, Donald Marshall Jr., a member of Member 2 First Nation, was arrested for catching 210 kilograms of eel, which he sold for $787.10. He was charged with fishing without a license, selling eels without a license, and fishing during a closed season. He claimed he was allowed to catch and sell fish by virtue of a treaty signed with the British Crown. In 1999, the Supreme Court held that catching and selling eels was valid under both the 1760 and the 1761 treaties between the Mi'kmaq and the British, and that the federal fishing regulations, such as season closures, and the requirement of a license infringed on that treaty right. This finding legitimated the Aboriginal fishing industry. <clears throat> Commercial fishing has been presented as a solution to the economic disenfranchisement that Mi'kmaq have experienced, which, given the serious decline of the fishing industry in the Maritimes, is a bit of a joke. Oh, you're poor. We have this dying industry. Would you like to join us? People who promote the Mi'kmaq fishing industry see it as a link between our traditional fishing practices, which were for survival, and our participation in the industry. And I think this parallel is a false one. I certainly agree we have fishing as a treaty right, but I don't see the fishing industry as reflecting our traditional values. The fishing industry reflects the attitude that nature is there to be exploited for gain. That kind of wholesale slaughter in exchange for economic power is simply not commensurate with the Mi'kmaq values that I inherited. There's something there that was imported by the French and the British and reinforced through the fur trade. In fact, I propose that the modern commercial fishery is even more removed from Mi'kmaq values than modern day vegan practices are. Commercial fishing frames fish as objects to be collected for exchange, while veganism is rooted in a relationship with animals based on respect and responsibility. You tell me which one seems more authentic. The ability to reinterpret our traditions and our rituals enabled my ancestors to survive genocide, famine, disease, forced moves, reserves, residential schooling, and a host of other colonial ills. Similarly, we must find ways to adapt to the increasing individuality of urban life. Urban Aboriginals like myself embody our traditional values in new rituals. Vegan meal preparation and consumption can become infused with transcendent significance as we recall our connection with other animals, our shared connection to the creator, and prefigure a time when we can live in harmony with other animals, like Glooscap did before the invention of hunting. Veganism offers us a sense of belonging to a moral community whose principles and practices reflect the values of our ancestors, even if they may be at odds with their traditional practice. 
At stake in the creation of an Aboriginal veganism is the authority of Aboriginal people, especially women, to determine cultural authenticity for ourselves. Dominant white discourse portrays our culture as embedded in the pre-colonial past. But Aboriginal cultures are living traditions, responsive to changing circumstances. In retelling and reinterpreting our stories, or creating new stories, Aboriginal women claim authority over our oral traditions. In doing so, we recognize that our oral culture is not fixed in time and space, but is adaptable to our needs, to the needs of our animal siblings, and to the needs of the land itself. To close, I'd like to say a few words about how the Mi'kmaq express our perspective on the animal world through the phrase Mesitnomak, which means all my relations. What does the phrase mean exactly? Who are these relations? Well, I grew up by a lake in the woods, um, and most of my interactions with animals, apart from pets, were with animals that depended on the lake in some way. So deer, porcupine, bear, loons, fish, and above all, frogs. Frogs were my favorite. One day after a big rainstorm, my dad came in the house and said, hey kids, I need your help. A frog laid a bunch of eggs in this puddle out back and it's drying up now and they're all going to die. If we don't get them into the pond, they're all going to die. So for the next two hours in the hot sun, we move these gelatinous frog eggs and these squirmy little tadpoles from their shrieking puddle into the pond, from the puddle to the pond, from the puddle to the pond again and again. And as we did so, I realized that to my dad, the fragility of these animals mattered in the same way that our own fragility mattered. So for me, that was a concrete experience of what all my relations actually means. It means let me not forget our mutual vulnerability and let the way that we treat one another reflect the kinship ties that bind us all. Thank you and walaliok.